Good morning. I'd like to welcome any of our guests who might be here for the first time. We're always grateful to have anyone who comes to worship with us and pray that um, God will be glorified and exalted in our minds and our hearts. Today is what we call Palm Sunday. This is the triumphal entry when Jesus now enters into Jerusalem and it's uh, crown him or crucify him. The moment has become and it's what we have called Holy Week. So this morning we're going to partake of the Lord's table together as we begin to look at the passion of Christ. Uh, what, what, what a week this is for the believer. It, it's the week that forms the foundation of the rest of our weeks and our life. So we must fight to never let this get away from our minds and our hearts to keep ourselves in the love of Christ as Jude has exhorted. So to not lose our, our first love, but to battle for that. And so whatever your conscience conviction is about celebrating special days in the church, whether you think every day is alike or different, what we can always agree upon is the beauty of the cross, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so we will enter in as a body this week and, and meditate on those things. So as a unified church, let us set out this week to ponder and praise God for the work of Christ on our behalf. And if you don't like the Easter bunny, baskets, eggs, rituals around this time, I don't either. I'll eat them. But I can receive brothers and sisters who differ on these things and can truly celebrate the glory of Christ together as a church. So what we're going to do this week in remembering our Holy Week Today, I want to prepare our hearts for this week as a church to set the table so that we don't miss the blessing that is before us. And then I'm going to ask that you be very deliberate to slow down this week and get some quality time alone with the Lord and meditate on these things. So slow down, find a way. And then at the church on Thursday night, uh, we're going to gather uh, in that first room when you walk in, and we're just going to kind of read the upper room discourse in John 13 through 17. We did this last year, and we'll pray together and read each chapter. So if you can make that, um, would love to have you for that. Friday evening, we'll have our service and have communion together. And then Sunday morning, we'll gather and celebrate the risen Christ uh, as a body. So I also want to encourage you to do the work of an evangelist. This is a time more than ever to invite people to come and hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And on Easter Sunday, we will just focus in on that gospel. And so I encourage you to go invite friends, families, workmates, neighbors. We, we spent the whole beginning of this year learning how to share our faith. And so I, I encourage you now is, is to step out in faith and go and invite people to hear why did Christ rise from the dead and what does that mean to them and we will focus in on that. So invitations, if, if you need any, they're, they're back there to hand out to friends and neighbors. So let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Father, my heart is so glad that the veil has been torn in two. I thank you for so many years of dwelling where I had no access to you. I thank you for opening my eyes and opening my heart to see Thank you for Jesus Christ, who that veil was torn in two by his work, and that we sit here this morning with full access, favorable access to the living God. Lord, we praise you for this. We worship you. I pray now as we open the word of God, Lord, that your spirit would just manifest and illuminate to our minds the truths. Let us understand them with our minds and let our hearts be made glad and stirred in affection for Christ and that our will would be set to serve the King of Kings. So please, God, do what no human can do. Come meet us, and, and let us, by your Spirit, behold the risen Christ and worship together as a church. Prepare us for this week. God, what a special week and time for us. Lord, pour out abundant grace on your body. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, if you'll turn with me, we're, we're going to be looking at Isaiah 53. Isaiah chapter 53, what an amazing book in the Bible. Some have called Isaiah the fifth gospel. Um, I understand why they say it. I heard John MacArthur actually call it the first gospel um, because it comes long before, 700 years before Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
He also said, I think it's the first epistle. It should come right after Acts and in between Romans because it's the same interpretation of the Gospels as Paul, Peter, and John of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so it's showing the divine authorship of the Bible. This is pretty amazing stuff. Isaiah 53 continues to be one of the most profound, clear teachings on the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the more I study it, the more I stand in awe of this plan of God. And as Isaac Watts said, it demands my life, my soul, my all. So be taken away this morning, 700 years. Our country, had that's three times more than we've existed when he told us exactly how Jesus would die and how he would be raised. Worship this morning, I pray. So as we begin, I want to set the structure of this passage for us. It really begins with God speaking in Isaiah 52, verses 13 through 15. Behold, my servant will prosper. He'll be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. And then he closes out chapter 53 in verses 11 through 12 with God speaking again. And and so this is him talking about the great salvation that he has designed in eternity past. The salvation that we are going to look at all week was, it's, it wasn't a plan that went bad. It's not God responding to man's bad decisions. It wasn't willy-nilly. It was planned from the infinite wisdom and mind of God to the praise of His glory and grace, this gospel. And it's overtaken my heart this week in study. That's big that it was 700 years beforehand. Just tremble at that and don't let that be familiar. So let's set the context of Isaiah 53. The mystery of Christ is given to us. The two advents of the Lord, his both comings, the the time he would come and be sacrificed for sin, and then his second coming as the king of kings. So the humiliation of Christ and the exaltation of Christ. So let's begin then in Isaiah 52, 13. Behold, my servant will prosper and he will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. I want you to hear those words. What jumped out to me is those are the same words in Isaiah 6 when he gets a vision in the temple and sees God high and lifted up. And John later tells us that that vision in Isaiah 6 was Jesus Christ. And so he will have the name that is above every name. Look at Isaiah 52, 15. He will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what had not been told them, they will see And what they had not heard, they're going to understand. And so he's going to be exalted. He's going to conquer the world and subdue nations. And his glory is going to come forth. And so Isaiah is showing you he is going to be fully God. This servant that I will now describe will be fully uh, fully God. And now he's going to move in chapter 53 that he's going to be fully man. So look at verse 14 of chapter 52 right in between that. But just as many were astonished at you, my people, so this this one who's going to be fully God, his appearance was marred more than any man in his form, more than the sons of men. And so there's the enigma, the part that the Jews could not get right. They missed this. They got verses 13 and 15. They were looking for this coming king who would throw down their enemies. They're waiting for that. But what they struggled so much with was the one who was going to put an end to their suffering, his life would end in suffering on a cross, and they had no place or understanding for it. But Isaiah did. Isaiah had it. In Luke 24, on the road to Emmaus, they're talking, and they're like, we thought this was the one, but he's been crucified, and it's the third day, and he hasn't, nothing's happened. And this one, his appearance, was marred more than any other man. This one is brutally beaten. So how do we understand this? And that's what Isaiah 53 is for. He's going to give us the answer to this troubling statement of Isaiah chapter 52. But what I would like to focus on this morning is is what I think will help us the most this week as we prepare for Holy Week. And if you'll look with me in Isaiah 53 10, we're going to see that the Lord was pleased to crush him, Jesus, putting him (coughs) <coughs> to grief. And so this statement seems to be what troubles so many people in the world now as they hear about Easter. I, I've read articles on it about divine child abuse 
uh, what, what a fake religion that would teach a father abusing his son. And they reject such a notion of the cross then as foolishness. And the answer to this question is the essence of Christianity and our hope and our, jo- our joy and our delight in the gospel. And so we have to get this right because eternity is at stake. And so this statement here solves a big problem because Ezekiel says that, that God takes no delight in the death of the wicked. He's not a cosmic killjoy rejoicing over that. Well, how then does God take delight in the death and the destruction of his own son? Not only the destruction, but he's the one doing the destroying. It'll be at his hand. His sword of justice is going to pierce his own son through. How is he taking delight in this? Isaiah 53.1, it's his arm that will disfigure the son of man, the servant of Jehovah. And we're told that he takes delight in it. That's the answer I think we must have in our hearts this morning. So God keeps calling him my servant. And so I want to look at God's servant this morning. So first, I want you to see the rejected servant, if you'll come into verse 2. Who's believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of a parched ground. He had no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. And so when you read Isaiah 52, 13, you you expect a great entrance for one as mighty and one who is God and much fanfare. And there was no glorious descent when infinity entered into this world. There was no room for them at the inn. He was born into a manger and the announcement was made to shepherds. He had no form or majesty that we should be drawn to him. This one entered into the world and he had a quiet, simple upbringing. And there was nothing special if you would look upon him. There was no halo. There was no distinction externally that you would have just said, this is the son of God. Nothing special to the eye about him. And so I get that he would be somewhat ignored. I get why he would be somewhat unknown. But what I don't get then is look at verse 3. He wasn't just unknown. He was despised and he was forsaken of men. He's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face. He was despised and we did not esteem him. It's another level. He was despised. He was rejected. Why would the Son of God be despised and rejected? Well, the answer is in Isaiah 53, 6. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. And so in in Genesis, we're created by God and we were made in his image and we were made for him. We were to find our joy and our delight and all of our glory in him, all of his perfections and who he was. And the fall came. And in the day that you sin, you're going to die and you're separated from God. And the fall did so much harm to us individually and as a world, the brokenness has entered in. And now the brokenness is we glory in created things. We worship the image of an image of an image. And we glory in the really wrong things, mostly ourselves. And so the fall has caused us all to be sheep who have gone astray. We've gone away from our creator and who we were made for. And therefore the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all treat God as if he's nothing. How can that happen when you have God and all of his perfections? How can we treat that as if it's nothing and all the things of earth are better and more? That's sheep that have gone astray, finding value in things bigger and more than God. And yet God has these created ones that he wants to pour out blessing upon. He wants to rejoice over and have fellowship with, bring into his family. He wants to have a relationship unhindered, and he wants to have it eternal. He wants you to enjoy him supremely forever. I will be their God, and they will be my people. And they despise, and they hate him, and they hate his glory, and we sin against him daily. And so the question is, can't God just forgive them? Can't he just let bygones be bygones? Surely he's big enough 
to get over us not treating his glory like it's nothing. Sweep it under the rug. It's what we do in my family. Let's act like it didn't happen. And the problem is that we violate him. He's too good to act like his glory isn't valuable and it's nothing. God cannot ignore that. It would say his glory is small, not important, or no big deal. Sin is a big deal. It's the biggest deal that we have to deal with. And it has separated you from God. And it's brought his wrath upon you as you sit here this morning. It's a big deal. And so what this whole week is about, how do you resolve this problem with God and man, this issue of sin? And for most, the answer is go work hard at being good. Go be the best version of yourself. Maybe a little religion could help you. Maybe just ignore it. Ooh, I can't hear you. Come up with your own ideas. I think this is how you get right with God. Or you can flat out ignore it. I want to give you God's answer to this problem this morning, and it's Isaiah chapter 53. It pleased the Lord to crush his son on Calvary's tree. That is the place where God's glory is seen for the infinite value that it is. That he would punish his own son with all of his wrath on that cross for our sin. Sin is seen for what it is at the cross. And we see the love of God for us at the cross as well. How we can be loved and rejoiced over by God. How we can be adopted into his family, the cross. I resolve to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. There's a way, and I want to show you that this morning as we enter into this week. How could the father be pleased to treat his son like that? I must have an answer. And the answer is astounding. Look with me in verse 10. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering. God dishonoring sin cannot be swept under the rug. And it matters that you have treated God as if he's nothing. I want you to hear that really clear. It matters that you have valued things more than God. You've belittled him. Romans 1 says you've suppressed him. You've put him out of your thinking. It matters. Justice is the soul that sins must die. And you're a criminal against God and you've stole his glory and the the verdict is guilty by God himself. And so if our sin can just be swept under the rug or ignored, uh, if it can't be, what, what do you do with your sin? God wants to delight over a people and bring them near. What do you do with sin? you got a holy God who's just. He's got to punish it. You can't wipe it away. (sighs) Can't do that. That's what hell is for. Hell is for that sin. For all of eternity to sit under the wrath of God for that sin. That's what hell exists for. But what I'm here this morning, I want to tell you what heaven exists for. If the Son would render Himself a guilt offering I will deal with this. What was a guilt offering? Moses laid out several uh, offerings for sin. And it was laid out in Sinai and in Leviticus. It's recorded for us. If we broke God's law, a sacrifice was made to satisfy God's broken law. And this guilt offering was offered to God to atone for the sin that we had done against the Creator. This typology and this picture. And in a burnt offering, the, the, the whole thing was consumed. You had the the sin offering where you'd put blood on the altar, but here the whole sacrifice is put on the altar and it's consumed because it was a type of him who was to come, Jesus Christ. If he would render himself a guilt offering, if he would be that burnt offering, I love the word himself. It means his soul. If he would give the totality of his being and be consumed, I will release you from your iniquities. The word himself should bring you to praise this morning. He gave his whole being to be consumed on Calvary's tree, marred more than any man. Wrath of God, three hours undiluted on the cross. (coughs) The 
The guilt offering were animals. You'd bring the lamb, the bull, or the goat. But this day, the priest would not bring an animal for the burnt offering. He brings himself to be the offering. And Jesus comes to be crushed and put to grief and consumed by the Father's wrath for our sin. He was the substitute consumed for our sin. And I want you to hear this. He, he was willing. If he would render himself, this was the most willing sacrifice. He went to the cross willingly to be this guilt offering. If he would render himself a guilt offering. And so he went up to be that on our behalf. And the glory of God is that the Father was pleased to consume the whole thing, to crush him in his wrath. And then it says the Son was pleased to render himself a guilt offering. He was pleased to do this for God and for us. For the same reason, for the glory of God in this most amazing gospel. The Father was pleased and the Son was pleased and willing to go be that burnt offering. But he was perfect. He was without sin. Whose sin was he being offered for then? It can't be his own. And I want you to see in Isaiah 53, he doesn't want you to miss this. In verse 4, he says, Surely our griefs he himself bore. In verse 4, our sorrows he carried. Verse 5, he was pierced through for our transgressions. And later in verse 5, he was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him. And again in verse 5, by his scourging, we are healed. And verse 6, the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Verse 8, for the transgressions of my people to whom the stroke was due. Verse 11, as he will bear their iniquities. Verse 12, he bore the sin of many. I, if you can't walk away from this passage and miss whose sin was Jesus dying for on that cross, ours. Ten times in this passage, he died for our sin, not his own. For all who will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, he hung on that tree for his bride. This is what pleased the Father and the Son. This is the heart of Christianity. You're staring at it this morning. God the Father was pleased to crush his own son on that cross as the guilt offering. God the Son was pleased to go die on that cross and be the guilt offering for us. He was willing to be marred beyond recognition and consumed in the wrath of God till he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why would any father do that to his son? Why would any son be a willing servant to do this? What would hold the creator of the universe on that cross was not nails. It was love to his father and love for us that he was going to purchase and so verse 10, the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. I pray that you'll sit in that this week. It pleased God to crush him. All that we'll look at on Good Friday pleased the Father. And it just preaches. God doesn't just save sinners. He delights in it. Don't miss that. It's his glory to show mercy to whomever he shows mercy. He doesn't just accomplish salvation and apply it. It pleases him to grant it to his children. And then you think of the one that was being crucified. In Isaiah 42, 1, Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. When he was baptized, the father said, this is my beloved son in who I am well pleased. And then I read, the Lord was pleased to crush him, to put him to grief. The word crush in the Hebrew, it's in the intensive stem and it meant to shatter to pieces. 
And grief was extreme sorrow and pain. It pleased him to shatter him to pieces and put him in extreme pain. It just takes your breath away. Yahweh is pleased to do this, this extreme sorrow, and, and throw intense pain upon his son, the servant in this verse. He's pleased. And then in verse 11, the son will look at it and be satisfied. He'll be pleased. Just this big pleasing of the father and the son for this gospel. So that's the rejected servant. Now I want you to secondly look with me at the majesty of the atonement. And we'll see it in verses 10 through 12. <laughs> Isaiah is going to give four benefits that were won by Jesus by this act of being a guilt burnt offering for us that he won for him, himself at the cross. In Hebrews 12, we're told that Jesus endured the cross for the joy set before him. So there's a joy set before him and he endures the cross. And Isaiah now is going to give us some insight. What were some of those joys that caused him to endure the cross? Uh, Isaiah flushes it out just a little bit more. And so I want you to see this morning to help understand the beauty and glory of this week, why the Father and the Son were so pleased in this work and why we should be satisfied and pleased in this work and to enter into its rest. First, look in verse 10. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief if he would render himself as a guilt offering. He will see his offspring and he will prolong his days and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hands. So he's going to see his offspring. And Jesus said this when he was on the earth, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And then in Revelation, John gets a vision into heaven of all the redeemed people. And he says, they're so great, you can't count it. They're from every tribe and tongue and nations from the ends of the earth that Christ has redeemed. And Jesus would receive a spiritual offspring from his seed. So if a Christian, you are an offspring of the cross this morning. He purchased your pardon. He paid your debt. Do you realize this morning, if you believe in Christ as your Lord and Savior, you were part of the joy that was set before him when he was hanging on the cross? As he went up on that tree, it was a bride that he gave his life for, and you, you were in his mind and heart. I pray that you marvel as all of his followers gather around the world this week to worship the risen Christ. By your faith, you are part of the people of God, his tribe, his family, his posterity. That's marvelous. And then second, he conquered death and inaugurated eternal life. We're told that he will see this great offspring. And so verses eight through nine, he dies. He's put in a tomb. How is he going to see his offspring? Well, because he was laid in a tomb. And three days later, some of his followers went down to it. And they said, the angel said, he's risen. Just as he said, Again, 700 years before that the father would crush his son, he would rise. He's going to prolong his days. Isaiah called him the father of eternity. By the resurrection of the dead, he sits on David's throne and his kingdom will have no end. He conquered death and he inaugurated eternal life. And thirdly, he's going to save sinners in verse 10. The good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hands. What is his good pleasure? Well, verse 11, as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. And by his knowledge of the righteous one, my servant will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. So I want you to hear this. He will justify the many. He's going to bear their iniquities. He will remove sin and he's going to bring justification. He's going to bring this declaration where God himself is going to declare you just and right before him. But you are now accepted and beloved in Christ by the work of Christ. He's going to justify the many. His resurrection accomplished what delighted the Father in himself, why they were so pleased. It was salvation. And that now we can stand justified before God and blameless in his sight. He can now be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. His glory and your forgiveness, Mary at the cross, 
that God would punish sin and he would punish it in his own son so that he could forgive your sins is the glory of God. And they all met there. In verse 11, Jesus is gonna look upon this and be satisfied. Bethlehem, Gethsemane, Calvary to the grave, no regret to bring you into a right standing before God is what pleased him. He's pleased for you to sit accepted in the beloved this morning. And every time the gospel is preached and someone believes, he's satisfied. When one sinner repents, all heaven rejoices. It's amazing that he came to save sinners among who I am foremost. Praise be to God. He created a large offspring He conquered death and inaugurated life and he saved us from our sins and put us in a just standing. And then fourthly, the enjoyment of all the spoils of his victory. And verse 12, therefore I will allot him a portion with the great and he will divide the booty with the strong because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Isaiah now moves into a battlefield picture where there's a great war that has been won and waged. And in that day, then the emperor would bestow on the winning general the largest of the spoils. And Jesus now will get a portion with the great. And this one in Isaiah 53, single-handedly won the battle. And by his death, all the spoils are his. And what's Jesus going to do with them? Well, he's going to divide the booty with the strong, which... And the Hebrew means the numerous, the many, the nations. All that he receives, he's going to share with us so that we'll be joint heirs in Christ. He'll share all the spoils that he won from this battle at Calvary's tree to all who belong to him. So hear this, believer in Christ. One day you're going to share with Christ all the spoils that he won at the atonement. We have some great benefits right now, but there's some amazing ones that are still to come. And you're going to enter into this celebration that's going to last for all of eternity. And people who only deserve to be damned will divide the spoils with Christ that he won when he poured out his life for us and was numbered with the transgressors. For all of eternity, you're going to be a joint heir with Christ. And so the fountain of every blessing is the work of Jesus Christ. And Isaiah 53 is one of the most beautiful pictures of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was numbered with us, and it means that he was treated as if he had, been, he had done all that we had done. He was willing to become all that we had done on that cross imputed to his account so that he could be punished in our place for our iniquities so that we could stand justified in him. If you'll believe this morning, you'll be treated as if you had done all the things that he had done. This Easter, John Stott said the whole Bible is sin is you you and me substituting ourselves for God, putting ourselves where only he deserves to be. And then God substituting himself for us putting himself where only we should be on a cross and a grave dead for sin. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this portrait was painted 700 years before Jesus was incarnated on this earth as a baby and died on a cross in our place and was raised for our justification. I pray you'd behold such glory and majesty this morning and this week. So as we close out, I want to bring it full circle. There's one last delight. There's one last pleasure necessary in Isaiah 53. It pleased the father to crush his son. It pleased the son to hang on that cross and accomplish the father's plan. And our delight as well is to join the Trinity in being satisfied and delighted in this plan and what it did to bring about our salvation. Faith is, it's a, it's a, a knowledge, it's an agreement, and it's a, a trust. It's a giving your life to this truth. It's not enough to just know it in, in your head. It's a surrender. 
And it's, I'm pleased with what Christ has done. I see the beauty of it and I treasure it and I trust it and I'm going to give my life to this truth. I'm pleased with God's satisfactory work and salvation in Christ and I'm going to enter into his rest that Christ has accomplished. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. May we delight in this gospel every day of our lives. And I pray that you see the beauty and the fullness and that you would come to light with the Father and the Son and the most beautiful gospel that there ever has been. As I close out, this is a stupid illustration, but I'm going to share it anyways. I just, I got this little granddaughter. She's just so cute. And she, her favorite thing now is Beauty and the Beast. You ever seen it? I hate to say I've seen it way too many times now. Every time she spends the night, she has to eat dinner in our bed and watch Beauty and the Beast. And I try to fall asleep, but I, it keeps me awake. I, I'm starting to like Gaston. That's not good. <laughs> so, but as I'm thinking of this movie, this man, the Beast, was marred beyond recognition. He was appalling to look at. And then, as this movie progresses, I think you guys know the story, so I'm going to save a lot of time. Belle finally kisses the beast. As she kisses it, it transforms him and saves him, and this metamorphosis makes him beautiful. And I heard, I heard in a sermon a while back, Jesus took it one step further. Jesus had to become a beast he had to come and, and be disfigured more than any man in Isaiah 53, marred beyond recognition, one that people turn their head from. But he did it so that you could become a beauty and you could be justified in the sight of God, declared righteous and beautiful this morning, wrapped in the righteous garment of Jesus Christ. You can be forgiven of every sin that you've ever done and declared righteous in the presence of God. How beautiful is that? We're to live upon this. And this is how we become more and more beautiful now in our practice. He's so lovely. And he's made us so beautiful by his doing and what he's done before God. And the way that he did it was through the cross and resurrection. And by his resurrection, we are healed and we're going to join in all the booty of every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, both now and forever. So to God be the glory for the servant of Isaiah 53. Amen? Father, I thank you for Jesus Christ. I thank you for this promise that you gave to us through Isaiah and the Holy Spirit. I thank you for the picture of the one who would enter the world and would be this very one. I thank you that he was willing. He was willing to leave glory and have no place to lay his head and become marred beyond recognition. That he was willing to bear the full wrath of God that we would have to go to hell and bear forever. He was willing to bear that on a tree. Who would be willing, who had full knowledge of your wrath and to the severity and to what degree, would baptize him into a bloody sweat in Gethsemane? God, thank you for this one. As we remember him now at the table, may our hearts be overwhelmed that he was willing. May our hearts be overwhelmed, Father, that you were pleased to crush your own son so you wouldn't have to crush us. God, let that make hearts glad, full. Let it transform us. Let it change us. Let us remember by faith then this morning the table of our Lord. God, we eat and drink with great joy and gratitude for this gift. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.